All right there. Part three for the Nadarians. The Anthozoans, which means flower animals. And this one is going to deal with the corals and the sea anemones. Mostly you might not know anemones for places where clownfish hang out, but they are much, much more than that. In relationship to the alternation of generations life cycle, the anthozoans, unlike the other nadarians, have simply a polyp stage. They completely lack the medusa. Both anemones and corals have the same kind of body type. We have the stalk-like polyp with the tentacles coming out of the top end, the oral end, the central mouth, the digestive cavity. The same is true here. We've got the coral polyps here coming out of the rocky casing, but you can see that they have a similar body plan with the central opening, mouth opening, tentacles around the ring, and always the same kind of polyp form. The anemones come in all kinds of shapes and sizes, and you can see some of them are absolutely stunning in terms of their coloration, their external coloration. Others have color because of the symbiotic relationships that they have with organisms that live within their tissues. The basic form, as we said, is the polyp, and it has the tentacles, the ring of tentacles around that central mouth opening here with the digestive cavity. The tentacles have stinging cells where they protect themselves as well as entangle and trap the prey. Additionally, they have a pedal column, pedal as in foot, and this column here is extensible and contractible. It supports the body, and they have a pedal disc, right, which attaches to the substrate. This pedal disc can actually uh, contract as well as expand, and they can glide along the surface of the substrate by expanding and contracting that pedal disc, which is one of the ways that they can move. So if you looked at the internal anatomy of a polyp in the anthozoans, you'd see that they have, again, the pedal disc, they've got the stalk or <clears throat> the pedal column, and they have a sphincter muscle, which allows them to actually draw the oral opening closed. They have a concha, which are defense mechanisms that we'll talk more about later. And they've got gametogenic tissue here. This is where they'll produce their sperm and their eggs. A lot of the times we don't even see the coral polyps because they're pulled inside the coral skeletons. But if you were to look closely at an extended coral polyp, you can see that they look exactly like the polyps of the sea anemones. Anemones can be solitary or colonial. They can have short, relatively short tentacles. They can have much longer tentacles. And in each case, they have the oral opening in the center of the organism. And this one, the coloration, is an important piece of this particular anemone's life. We'll talk more about that later. From an ecological perspective, anemones can be very important symbiotic partners. Here we have a crab with an anemone on it for a hat, whereas this for protection. In this case, this crab sits inside this giant green anemone waiting. As I mentioned before, these are a concha. In this case, they are being extruded out through the body wall. They're also being extruded more fully here. If you look down below, you can see that these are coming out of the actual oral opening. And finally, you can see these, a tremendous number of aconcha. Now, these are threads that are shot, literally shot out of the body at high speed. And they can be shot right through the body wall or out the oral opening. And they are covered with nematocysts. So this is the protection mechanism that these anemones have. Also, most corals and some anemones have symbiotic algae that live in their tissues. These are small dinoflagellates that photosynthesize, providing a tremendous amount of nutrition for the corals. And all the coloration of the corals that we see in the tropics, those come from the color of the symbiotic algae that live within them. If a coral bleaches, it loses those algae and they become white. The corals have these symbiotic algae living in their tissues. As a result, the photosynthesizers in this symbiotic pair need to be close enough to the light to take advantage of the light energy for photosynthesis. So these organisms live close to the surface, and without this, they cannot survive. Their input, the sugars that are produced in the photosynthetic process, are so important for the corals that 
they are the difference between the coral living and the coral dying. Because remember, corals live in a relatively barren ecosystem in terms of amount of uh, nutrients in the water, and therefore these symbiotic algae, they are the reason that coral reefs and the entire coral reef ecosystem can exist. Some solitary anemones make their own tube, which protects them. They can draw back inside that tube all right, in a way that's somewhat similar to a coral making its external skeleton. Most anemones, however, do not make that kind of a tube. They simply live with their musculature exposed, and you'll see many, many different kinds. And you can see here why people would originally call them flower animals. The anemones are quite muscular in nature in their side body, so they can be standing upright and be extended very, very long. Here that sphincter muscle is drawn in, and they can actually create the pole with the sphincter muscle to close them down and contract way in. Other times you can see here that they can break themselves free of the substrate and actually move, and here is the petal disc all expanded. So here we can see some diagrammatic representations of an anemone, and once they catch their food with their tentacles here, then that will allow them to bring the food in. They actually will constrict the musculature here in the, their stalk, bring it all the way down. Once they've had some food, a taste of some food, they get very excited. They'll extend their whole stalk out into the world here trying to get themselves out, up, or out as hot, much as they can to capture food. Once they ingest some food, you can see that there's a nice constriction right here where they are trying to draw food upward after they've digested it. So there's this upwards peristalsis that leads to the excretion or ingestion of the food residues. Because remember, their mouth is the same as their exit pore, if you will. Here again we see the the cross-cut diagram of this anemone, and in this particular regard, we want to notice that we have this actinopharynx. This is the area where the food comes in. It's highly expandable. Those pleats create more surface area. Remember, these have extracellular digestion, so they secrete enzymes, which help them digest their food, and then their waste gets exited right out the same place that the food came in. From a reproductive perspective, anemones can reproduce both sexually and asexually. If they reproduce sexually, then their eggs are fertilized within their gastric cavity, and then the young larvae are released through the mouth and become temporary free-swimming larvae, and then when they're mature enough and they find a place to attach, they will settle out and attach. Here we can see a stylized life cycle diagram, and as you can see, the adult stage right, reproduces sexually. It releases either sperm or egg. The fertilized egg, this happens within the water column generally speaking, creates a planula larvae. You've seen that term before in the other groups of nadarians. That planula settles down to the bottom of the ocean, becomes a polyp, and then the sea anemone grows up from that polyp and we get the adult. So notice that there's no medusa stage here. There are some cool variations in terms of how anemones and corals reproduce. This particular anemone, Epiactus prolifera, is unique in that it's one of the brooding anemones. They can reproduce asexually. Here's a particular clone that has been budded off asexually from the bigger adult. Same is true here. Same is true here. And these are environmentally tied in. The type of reproduction is connected to the stability of the environment. So your question is, when would it be more favorable to undergo asexual reproduction, producing clones of yourself and then brooding them on your skirt, if you will, underneath the tentacles? And here we can see organisms living on the edge, in this case, of their mother's tentacles. Okay, Right underneath them, she drapes them down. They actually cover up the uh, brooding young and protect them until they're ready to go off on their own. So the question would be, when, in stable or unstable environments, would it be best to be reproducing sexually? Given that these can brood up to 300 or more young under the tentacles of a mother, these brooding anemones really, really do have the opportunity to reproduce a great deal. The one downside is that these are all clones of the original, 
and so therefore little genetic variation here if the reproduction is done totally asexually. These are all clones. That means they're exactly identical to the parent organism here. They've budded off. They will break off and become their own new adults. From an ecological perspective, anemones can provide a tremendous amount of protection for other organisms in the ecosystem. So here we have some eggs that have been laid at the base of the anemone stalk so that those eggs reap the benefit of the protection of having stinging cells nearby. Who knew? Now it gets interesting. In Star Wars, we have the Clone Wars. Here in anemone colonies, we also have Clone Wars. What we'll see here is a boundary, the purplish red on one side, the lime green on the other. These are the specialized boundary anemones. These are the warring clone members. They can detect a difference between their own clonal relatives and the ones across the way that are not directly related to them. And so there's a boundary. There's actually a split between the two colonies. And this colony will fire lethal stinging cells at the purple one, and the purple one will fire lethal, st lethal stinging cells back. And there are particular kinds of tentacles called acrohagus or acrohagy, and they will help protect the organisms on the colony of, of their area. Oddly enough, we've also found out, however, that clonal aggression in Metridium senile, which is the common sea anemone that we find in this area of the world of the Atlantic, is quite a sexist thing, that males only fight with males and females only fight with females. So here you can see the boundary between two clones, the acrohagy. These are these specialized tentacles that are there for creating boundary and discerning us from them and also inflicting powerful stings to try to keep a, a safe space, a safe boundary here. So here we have a picture of some of the predators of anemones. The sea stars are voracious anemone eaters. Certain fish love a good anemone or a coral. The sea hares here, there's a couple of different sea slugs. These are pretty big sea slugs. They will be voracious predators on solitary anemone-like organisms. Much like corals, the giant sea anemone actually harbors symbiotic dinoflagellates in them where they get some of their nutritive materials from the symbiotic uh, actions of the bacteria that live in this. So they're very shallow water, can be huge in size, and are very common on the west coast. So this slide just goes to show you, you never know. So this is a big, giant green anemone. But interestingly enough, going right down into its central feeding area right, is a young duck. This is actually a whole duck that somehow died, was laying there, and then in it goes. So what will happen, we're not really sure, but the anemone is doing, anemone is doing a great job of biting off more than he can chew. Hard corals come in all different shapes and sizes. They try to maximize the area where the actual coral polyps will come out and they'll get exposure to the currents. So therefore, these ring-like patterns serve that quite well. Ecologically, those hard corals are crucial for actually building the structure of the reef. Elkhorn corner coral here is a coral that sits atop the reef crest, so important for being able to dissipate wave shock as well as provide the structure for many, many organisms to live in a, what becomes a very complicated ecosystem, despite the fact that there's very little nutrients in the water. There are lots of different kinds of corals. Octocorals are solitary, oftentimes found in much, much deeper water. There are other corals that are hard corals with the small tentacles just sticking out here in the center. You can see some dinoflagellate coloration down in there. These are just beautiful small coral heads. Soft corals or hard corals, the reforming corals, all just so important to the ecology of the tropical marine ecosystems. Here we can see all of the polyps extended out, even from a soft coral organism. So these are different only because the organism doesn't build a calcium carbonate covering. It builds a much softer, much less permanent kind of covering. Finally, we see these soft corals, both big and broad, with lots and lots of little, little, little teeny polyps. Both of these, the sea fan as well as the other soft coral here, so important in terms of gathering sunlight energy and converting it into chemical energy. 
and can't end the slideshow like this for the flipped classroom without a little off-the-mark comic. Here we can see that this place is spacious, has two bedrooms, plus all the anemones.